Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with YouTube knife and EDC gear reviewer, Treddy. I've been a subscriber to Treddy since the day my second daughter was born. I discovered him and several others for myself during that agonizing wait. I, I'm pretty sure it was more agonizing for my wife, but you know, for me too. And Treddy helped that time go by. Um, Treddy spelled seven ready when you do your search, uh, seven R E D I has been a YouTube go to for years, bringing viewers unique custom knives sometimes more readily available in Europe, as well as the latest, most buzzworthy production knives. And like me, he is equal opportunity when it comes to folders and fixed blades. His taste is sophisticated, his evaluations are thorough, and his delivery style is smooth and confident. And I'm really excited to talk knives with this Knife World alum. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when new videos are uploaded. Also, download us on the uh, podcast app so you can hear us uh, when you're not attached to YouTube, which is probably rare. And then join us on Patreon. That would be lovely, where you can help support the show uh, in various ways and get some unique and exclusive content yourself. So you can do all that and check all that out on thenifejunkie.com. And for Patreon, be sure to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, it's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you carry multiple knives? Then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Treddy, welcome to the show. It's good to have you here, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Very cool and a very um, like uh, uplifting intro for uh, all the nice things you said about the channel there. <laughs> <laughs> all true, sir. All true. I mean, and we can tell just by looking down on that beautiful leather mat filled with uh, gorgeous and unique and different knives. I mean, some of these are, you know, low end. Some of these are very high end. And I love that sort of... Um, broad range of your collecting style but just so everyone knows i'm speaking to you you're in switzerland and um a lot of us don't know much about it i've seen it from a train twice it looked gorgeous but i didn't get off my wife fell in love with the place i thought i might lose her to the country at one point uh but swiss what's the knife community like in switzerland it's it's very sparse that's one of the reasons i uh so there is there is the victorinox Kind of Swiss Army knife knife crowd that is pretty large in Switzerland, Austria, Germany, and also some of the French speaking countries. But like knives, like the stuff we see here, like modern folding knives, uh, custom knives, it's pretty uh, sparse and uh, far and few between. There's also not like a large community where you kind of gather. There is some stuff like that in uh, some of uh, some of France and also in Germany, but in Switzerland, it's very very rare you find like a guy on the street that is also into knives <clears throat> i have now uh, actually found a couple that live a, a bit around me but it's very very small and uh, it's also not something that is talked about quite a lot uh, uh, in in the media or something like that so it's a pretty underground thing here in switzerland that's also one of the reasons i started the channel so i could share the stuff with more people um yeah that comes as a little bit of a surprise to me because I know Switzerland as being much more permissive uh, country in Europe um, than most others in terms of weapons, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, you're allowed to own firearms in Switzerland, right? Yes, but it's it's mostly restricted to firearms, and that has its its origin in the um, how do you say it in English, like that it's a, it's a duty for every Swiss male to join the military service for a specific period of time. And it's also part of that service that you actually take your uh, duty rifle home. And oh. so they couldn't really outlaw guns because it would completely interfere with a, a mandated uh, service duty. And uh, for that reason, guns are very differently treated. In terms of knives, we have we can do more than Germany, for example. So that means we can have stuff that is one-handed opening and locking. Mm -hmm. And Germans can only have one or the other. 
So one handed opening or locking, but not both. Man. Um, but we can't really have automatic knives except these super, super tiny ones. I got a couple of those. But yeah. everything automatic is illegal. Everything double edged is illegal. Uh, even fixed blades. But we don't have a specific like um, blade length limit. So it's very, uh, very sketchy and you have to be on your toes. Also, everything assisted is completely illegal. Assisted opening knives, completely really? illegal. So it's it's very weird how they came up with those rules, but that's how it is. Yeah, those rules sound almost as arbitrary as the rules in the United States, though uh, rules differ state by state with uh, knives and guns. Um, it's interesting to me that uh, military age men and women, I think, I guess in Switzerland, have their battle rifles with them. Um, and yet a double-edged, a two-inch double-edged knife is illegal. It's kind of interesting how these things work. I mean, they're to us, they're not mutually exclusive, but to lawmakers, I guess they are. They're just treated like the scary things you see on TV. I believe most people that actually decide these rules have never, have like no knowledge of the things. It's the same with guns, but with guns, they have just, they can't overcome that like uh, legal hurdle that they have to allow it for some people and then they can't completely outlaw it. And that's like our, our benefit. We also have like something like NRA, not exactly the same, but it's also a, a pretty strong uh, for Switzerland's, uh, um, for Switzerland's uh, number count um, organization that tries to, to keep everything at least as it is or make it better. But we can have also, if you're not uh, doing any service, you can own uh, rifles, but just uh, semi-automatic. You can own uh, handguns, and it's pretty easy to get them, but it also has some slight differences from Canton to Canton, which are our, uh, our um, states. Mm -hmm. and, but they can't really deny you getting a, um, a firearm if you're a law-abiding citizen, if you're over 18 and you don't come from a, a specific set of, of countries in, in uh, where there is some kind of conflict or people are known to have some issues uh, mm -hmm. with laws constantly. So if you're a Swiss-born 18-year-old male that is law-abiding or female for that matter, you, you are not it is not really possible to deny you the access to, hmm. to a firearm. Oh, that's that's an interesting uh, approach because uh, if you want it, you can get it. It's not necessarily, a, well, I guess that makes it a right, but uh, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily a pervasive cultural element. So there, there is a lot of like sports shooting. And of hmm. course, because like most uh, males, and it's only males that are required to go uh, into military service at the moment. So females do not have to do any kind of service. There is also like a weapons free service that you can do where you help out in, in some, uh, where you have our senior citizens or in hospitals or things like that. But it's all, all also not only for male um, 18 year olds. Um, now I kind of lost my train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I actually, this is all interesting to me because um, uh, you have, uh, I mean, the the premier YouTube knife channel from Switzerland, probably the only one I, I think I know of, but you have an extremely uh, varied range of knives that you feature on your channel. Uh, how do you get all this access uh, to these knives in a in a in a place that maybe isn't as, you know, excited about them? So like the almost none of these are bought in Switzerland. So I, I buy them uh, from U.S. websites. Of course, if you buy customs, you normally try to buy them from the maker if you can get access through them through Instagram mm -hmm. or through going to shows. But I only have been one time to a show and it was not a custom knife show. It was like the, um, the shot show, but for Europe in, in Germany. Uh, but that's a long time ago. And uh, now I will go to a custom knife show for the first time uh, in the beginning of February. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to get some nice stuff home from there. But most of this stuff is bought through Instagram, through um, Facebook knife sites where you can buy and sell stuff, right. and uh, through um, US retailers that have great international shipping costs. Because if I buy it there, it's just much cheaper than if I buy it here, even counting in shipping. There is a couple of stores in Switzerland that sell 
this kind of stuff, not costumes, but production knives. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them have on occasion some good offers, but in general, the price levels is uh, are much higher just because of um, VAT tax and all the things that are involved with that and the general like higher price level for everything in Switzerland. Okay. All right. So let's talk about your channel and the birth of it. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, we all get to a point when we all, where every, anyone who has a knife channel on YouTube gets to a point where they're understanding that the people around them are not interested and they don't want to hear about it. And so there are others you can bark out in, you know, to the clouds and there are others who will hear it and appreciate it. So tell me how you, uh, how you birthed your channel here and uh, what your goals were and where you, where you want to take this. So it actually started out. So first off, I wasn't really into knives and gun in the beginning, but then I have two older brothers. They went to military service and one of them got quite into guns and everything. And then he started watching Nothing Fancy on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sometimes I would us. walk in and watch a little bit and find it kind of fun, the like pretty budget friendly uh, knives. And then in the end, we decided we, we got to order some. And then there was one store in Switzerland that had like a $25 uh, in US pricing. It was like 50 Swiss francs in Switzerland, like a little Kershaw chill. I still have that. Mm -hmm. I could get it if I <laughs> can just hold on for a second. Sure. I love that Kershaw chill. How cool is it uh, that Treddy was uh, that was inspired by Nothing Fancy? Who wasn't inspired by Nothing Fancy? Maybe some of the uh, third and fourth generation knife reviewers. But look at this. RJ yeah, Martin. The original, uh, every, this knife is kind of uh, the cause of everything here on the table. Um, it has been well loved, some kind of tried to get another finish on the blade, has been sharpened quite a bit, also had a loose clip for some time, but it still works. It's not super like, great in terms of flipping action, but you can get it. And it is just looks a little bit like a folding steak knife. Mm -hmm. And I actually ordered the uh, half serrated version, but I just got the plain edge within the end, what was a good surprise. <laughs> but I just thought that the serration looked cool at that time. And I got this one and then I got really into nice lots of other budget friendly stuff. And uh, the first video I actually did was not about, uh, about knives. It was about a CO2 air gun that I got for oh. Christmas, I believe. But it was a really fancy one and there were no videos on it. It was like a, um, a lever action with like a brass kind of housing and wood stock and everything. And I did a video on that and that really blew up and I couldn't really understand. It was really crappy, like recorded with a, um, with a webcam and really, really bad quality. But it got up until now, it got like 180,000 views, more views <laughs> than any other of my videos ever. Wow. <laughs> but then after that, I thought, ah, oh, this is kind of easy. I probably could do that with other stuff as well. And then I started doing videos on, on knives. And also I got in that time frame, I got my first uh, um, first revolver and then, and then a uh, pistol. Later, I still own those as well and did some videos on those. And from then, it kind of uh, just did the occasional video when I got something new in and uh, it spiraled kind of out of control from there <laughs> but i never had any kind of real ambitions with the channel uh, i just wanted to kind of share this stuff and then uh, yeah later on i did uh, instagram and so on and so forth and came in contact with lots of people that uh, do the same thing but are mostly located in other countries i think it can be a a sort of uh therapeutic thing in a way I'm, i mean i'm not i'm not putting too much on making these videos but really you have an irrational um desire for um uh, acquiring ever ever more knives I, i'm not just saying you i'm saying us and um but also to evaluate them and then you want to let some of them go you can't you can't have all the knives um there's a desire to talk about them because there's some weird um, in in uh, inborn desire for these things, and most people don't get it. So I, I see how doing these kind of videos could spiral out of control. You get your hands on that Kershaw chill. You're like, who is this guy, R.J. Martin? You know, like he either makes he either designs knives that are twenty dollars for CRKT. Or he makes custom knives that are $2,000, you know, that are amazingly gorgeous. 
so who is this guy? And and so so starting a channel seems like a logical thing to do to someone whose whose uh, obsession is spiraling. For sure. And another thing that it has become more and more since I do a lot of uh, uh, buying and selling and trading and things like that is it is like a little um, an area where I can kind of uh, take a history of the collection and can go back and look at everything I owned at some time. And uh, so I never really lose the knife uh, for yes. good because I still have like photos on Instagram or a video at least of it uh, showing it off. And so I have a, like a little list of stuff that I uh, some uh, owned, even if I had to let it go to get something new. Yeah, sort of an archive of your yeah. of your um, um, hobby there. Uh, so how, how did your uh, uh, taste in knives, um, Jim? Could you go wide for a second? I saw a knife that I can't see in this view, but I want to ask about it, and maybe this is a good uh, segue into this question. But okay, in the very lower right of our view here, and if you're listening, it's just a and uh, he just picked it up. I don't know what it is, but it's really cool. Um, how did your uh, taste for knives develop and how have they gotten to where they are? What would you say your taste is? It oh, certainly has it. gotten much more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> for example, if you, if you compare these two. Yeah. So, um, yeah, at first I just had like budget friendly knives, nothing really over a hundred. A hundred was really, really expensive. The first knife that i bought that i thought wow that's quite a bit much uh, money for for what i'm getting uh was a, a manix 2 the regular first mm -hmm. kind of with the with the ball lock and black g10 and i believe at the time s30 v S30V. that was a knife that i thought wow this is quite expensive and i don't know if that was a good decision or not um but uh, from there it got more and more involved just not just in terms of pricing, but also getting more involved to to see what I really like. So it, it took me quite a long time to get like zoned in on the things that I like and to figure out which knives stay longer in the collection for which reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it is mostly uh, custom. I really like front flippers. Um, this is like the, the primary uh, mode of deployment that I uh, really fancy just because I think it's very functional especially for EDC it makes a knife very easy to carry it doesn't get in the way of anything you can really uh, open it fast and uh, reliably and it gives the knife just a very uh, complete overall form also in the in the closed position so I'm really really liking front flippers at the moment for about a year or two this has really been a focus but then i also like stuff that is really pushing the envelope of what is possible with like modern uh machining like this one here this is a vc edge interface this is like a 3.6 inch blade this has an s30v like cutting edge and it weighs 1.7 ounces what are the um what are the striations there are those uh that's carbon it's it's like a mostly carbon fiber blade Get out of here! So if you're if you're just listening, he's holding up a, a a beautiful blade that that alternates from the edge. The edge is silver, and then it has alternating concentric blade shaped uh, stripes that are uh, that are black silver, black silver, and the black part is carbon fiber. So this blade is half S thirty V and half carbon fiber. This is amazing. And the handle is mostly carbon fiber, and then you have your inset titanium lock board that has also been been carved out massively to save some weight. So you get a 3.6 inch full frame lock folder that weighs 1.7 ounces and has an amazing Holy action macro. without having any kind of weight in the blade to speak of. But it fires out like crazy and is extremely, extremely smooth. So this was my knife of the year uh, for 2021. And, and you're... I'm sorry, your point in bringing up the weight of the blade is that a lot of smooth action can be attributed, yes, to bearings, but also the weight of a blade. If you have a big, heavy blade, naturally it's going to drop uh, if it's on bearings. But what you're saying here is this blade is really damn light and it's on bearings and it has action like it's a heavy blade. Absolutely, yes. And I think that's very, very hard to achieve. And uh, this is like a very early custom of his it's like the number 22 Who's and this? this guy is really a guy to watch i think he could be like the next brian nadeau 
this is really amazing and i like stuff like that so really space age high-end stuff but i also like to have handmade customs with lots of natural materials like the Brad Zinker here with some sandbar stack. God, I also gorgeous. got some stuff with Mammoth recently that I really like. Okay, and so I want to I, I want to get to the Mammoth because that's my favorite material that I don't have. Um, <laughs> and and before you continue, because I asked you to tell me about your collection and you're doing that dutifully, but I need to stop you because I want to go back to the blade with the uh, with the carbon fiber uh, in the and S30V. No, the one before huh. that because yep. I want to see that one too. <laughs> Jeez. All right. So, but this. This knife here, tell us who this is again so people can do their research. That's uh, VC Edge is the, the company name. And uh, the guy that's that's making this, it's like a one guy a company, is Jason Van Camp. I believe he's located in, uh, in California and is a machinist and a knife maker. And I think this is his first model. There have been some iterations uh, on how he does the lock bar. And he now also does versions with uh, M390. Uh, in terms of the actual cutting edge of the blade. And this is the VC Edge interface. There is a video on this knife on my channel, I believe an unboxing and a full review, and you can find some links and some more information there if you're interested. Uh, he sells these in drops, but he doesn't do a lot of them. I believe he has not even done 50 of these. So he does a couple of them and then makes it available through his website uh, where you can get a hold of these interfaces. You know, this is something that's cool about the knife world in general. I mean, look at this beautifully handmade and, and machine-made piece. Very unique with that uh, alternating carbon fiber and S30 v, uh, v blade and all this. And this is a guy whose job is probably not this yet. And yet he's making knives that are at the pinnacle, uh, pinnacle of this industry. It's an, It's interesting that way. Like... In a way, it's like music or art or anything else. Like someone who's relatively undiscovered could be making the next Mona Lisa or the next, uh, you know, Abbey Road, but we just don't know about them yet. And then as people like you who, who who bring this wide and give this guy an opportunity to become, you know, something more. I, I think it's I think it's a it's a cool loop there because it's a knife maker who's got another job innovating because he likes knives and he likes machining. And then uh, it gets to the hands of someone like yourself and he goes wide. People see how, how amazing this work is. All right, and, and okay, so I wanna work also, back. Also, just yeah. also speaking to that, he also has a YouTube channel where he actually shows how he's making these, how he's evolving them. Do you see the CNC machining? All <laughs> One time he actually showed all the different, oops, all the different, um, ways he redesigned the lock bar that didn't work he had like 50 of these lock bars they were just too heavy or <laughs> didn't work for some kind of reason and that's really interesting when you want to know how laborious it can be to get something so perfect um as an end result how long it takes how much scrap you're producing so that's really really cool to um to see that on his uh, vc edge youtube channel and also showing knives that are not very well known to the general public or the mm -hmm. general knife enthusiast public, which is certainly not the general public, um, is one of their main purposes at the moment of the channel. So really trying to get stuff out in the limelight that, or the limelight that mm -hmm. I can provide with the channel um, that people have not seen uh, at all because I can certainly not uh, um, be um, like, how do you say, in competition with the larger channels for getting every new CVV in and showing yes, that. So right. I'm not even going to try that. I just want to show new stuff that hasn't gotten the attention that I think uh, it might deserve. And VCH is certainly one of the makers uh, that I would uh, put in that category. I mean, I think it's a smart niche to carve out. There are a, a lot of really good, I call them the trusted voices. Uh, there are a lot of trusted voices on YouTube who are getting all the new Civivis and they have great videos. I mean, I love watching those videos. Um, but if if that's not what grips you, you can't try and be that because it won't work. Eventually, you'll run out of steam. You won't run out of steam with the things you love here. I want to work backwards on two more of the knives that you, you you teased us with and we'll start with the brad zinker uh with the uh stag this thing this is a front flipper you you picked this up when you were talking about how one of your favorite uh, new design trends of the past couple of years is the front flipper uh tell us about this knife this was actually my first uh 
in the end, I ended up with two of these knives, which is a funny story. Like the pretty much the identical knife, just differing in the the steel was used and uh, the exact version of the sandbar stack. But I actually always liked Mr. Zinker's work, but I really hadn't had any kind of front flippers uh, that he makes uh, on my radar. And I just wrote him on Instagram, see if he if he does any kind of his knives also in a front flipper. And he said, yes, he does the, this is called the Urban Trapper Arc because it's like more curved than the yeah. regular Urban Trapper. And it's also available in a regular kind of flipper. And he has done it pretty cool here. He has like cut off the flipper and give it some jimping. So it actually has still a functional purpose when you're holding the knife. Nice. Uh, and then in the end, I decided to order one of these. And I think this is one of my first knives that I got like ordered, built to my specifications from a maker directly. And uh, Mr. Zinker is an absolute super great guy to deal with and uh, very, very accommodating. And then I bought this and this was like a million years in postage. <laughs> this was like sending all around the world. It was like six months or so. It was just on its way around the world. That's and painful. then we thought it was lost. And then he offered out of the kindness of his heart just to build me a new one. He had to complete, I, I just paid for one and he built me a second knife. Oh, that's so uh, cool. That had uh, different blades here. I think this is the an LMAX. Oops, I just bumped the camera. This is an LMAX. The other one was in CPM 154. Also um, sandbar stack, but of course in different uh, in different kind of uh, natural uh, version pattern. of it. So it looks a bit different, different pattern exactly. And uh, that one arrived, and ab about two months after I got the replacement knife, this one arrived as well. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, I had two, and of course, I paid him for the second one as well yeah. because it was so uh, so kind to do that. But in the end, I actually kept the um, I believe this is the second one. Excuse me, I, I actually kept the second one he made because I just liked how the pattern looks like a fake bolster or something here. Yeah, yeah. On this particular uh, model, the other one had a little bit more pattern going on, but not in such a interesting way as we have it here. But I couldn't keep both. I would like to, but uh, I got something other very cool from him uh, with some of the funds I got from selling the other one. But this is amazing just because it shows shows like handwork and uh, hand craftsmanship uh, on such nice uh, natural materials. This, How he yes. chamfered the, um, the stag right there with the inset screws. Uh, and it feels so nice in the hand. And this was like one of the key moments that actually um, spoke to me and said, I have to focus on custom knives. This is what I enjoy uh, in uh, acquiring knives and having knives. And this is a great custom to carry. This is so nice and slim great functional pocket clip deep carry uh the action is amazing That's beautiful. and has a nice hand rub satin and everything so one of my favorite customs to actually carry and use and also one of my favorite uh custom knife makers actually so uh you had 154 and an l max you kept the l max but it wasn't because it's l max it's because you like the uh the pattern on the on the stack right is that yeah. right? You kept the LMAX? Okay, so, and, and something else about this uh, shift to custom knives is developing a relationship with the knife maker uh, during the process, you know, and, and dis you know, discovering that there are humans behind these, obviously we know that, but getting to know those people and um, working with them and knowing that even though it's a custom knife and you have your ideas for it, I want this steel, I want this handle material, that they will take all of that information and interpret it in their way. And that's what you're going for them, going to them for in the first place. Uh, otherwise you make your own knives. Yeah, th that's certainly the case. And I always thought I, I watched, of course, videos like from uh, um, Jim Skelton and guys that just show off custom knives and they always talk. Yeah, it's not about uh, primarily the knives. It's about talking with the maker and getting a relationship. And I always thought this is so corny. Of course, it's about the knife. Why would you why would you buy the knife? It's not primarily about the knife. But I just learned specifically about uh, in this experience that it really there is really something there. And that's why I have ordered a couple of knives from Mr. Zinker uh, in the past. And the latest one I ordered was this one. Oh, God, that's gorgeous. Jeez. There is a lot of special things going on here because this is actually a size that he wasn't even offering. So there was, this is an urban Barlow in a flipper version. And 
normally there is only a 3 inch and a 3.5 inch this is a 3.25 inch oh. uh, version and they normally only have standoffs this has a a Damascus backspacer that he designed specifically uh, for this knife. He even uh, sent me the, the CAD kind of drawing and to see if I was fine with the design of this uh, backspacer, which I thought was really cool. It has some jeweling on the inside of the liners. I, I got. Let me describe this for a second, Treddy, for those who are only listening. Sure. This is imagine a Brad Zinker Urban Trapper. Uh, but this is called the Urban Barlow. So it has a very large and long bolster that goes about a third of the way down the handle in a dark, beautiful, dark gray titanium, I think. It's or is zirconium. That zirconium. Yeah. And, and that graduates into some sort of gorgeous bone or stag or what is this? Is this mammoth? mammoth? That's oh, my mammoth. Nudge. So this is like a really incredibly beautiful uh, version of something that you kind of have seen from Branzik. Long, slender, gorgeous uh, knife just really with some beautiful and, and it's got this damascus blade what is this damascus blade uh it's a it's a damn steel um it may be thor he built actually two that looked very similar to this mm -hmm. this has the gold anodized liners because it was more yellowish in the mammoth and then he did a different uh damascus pattern with a little bit more bluish greenish in the in the um um mammoth and then he and i said blue and i just like the more goldish uh, tone on the titanium better so i actually went for this uh, version i believe this is thor but i'm not a hundred percent sure on the pattern of the damage thor, thor. okay it, it this this is a i mean it's a beautiful knife it's unreal it's it it, it i'm sure it's robust as hell but when you look at it it looks like a piece of jewelry it is uh you know, man jewelry, of course, but yeah, it is that, that was what I was going for with this build. I wanted the like ultimate gentleman's folder, oh, God. and I think he kind of did a great job here. I, okay, so I have a I have something I I, I want to ask you, and and it has it, it's a big topic. So before I get to that, pull up that knife that we hadn't had a chance to see that was on the lower right. That just this. What is this? Okay. This this is also like a knife from a maker that I think needs a lot more attention. Uh, this is a Dutch maker called Michel Timmermans from MT Knives, and this is his Genesis model, which is the first model that he ever made. There have been different kind of variations. So there is the one, there is the the two, and I believe now there is the two point one uh, version of of the Genesis. The two point one has just a, a little bit of shorter bolster because the bolster is quite large. Mm -hmm. uh, on this one here and uh, this is a larger knife for my collection you see most of my stuff is around uh, three or 2.75 if you look at this one to like three and a half max i don't really have a lot of stuff that is over that in terms of a folding knife and this is just at uh, three and uh, three and a half uh, in terms of overall length and this is just an absolutely gorgeous design um, I believe the blade is RWL 34 and he did a finish on the blade that uh, he hasn't done before and that I only have seen before on this um, mm. Wii knife, the Thug, I believe. This yes, like yes, yes. dark hand satin finish. And I really, really wanted that finish and I uh, spoke to him and he said, yeah, he will try it out on a, on a spare blade and if it works, he will offer it. And he did an amazing job here. And I think it goes so well with the zirconium bolsters, the um, snakeskin carbon fiber uh, scales, zirconium large backspacer, dark tumbled um, titanium pocket clip, 3D milled and then bronze anodized uh, pivot colors. It's a liner lock, it runs on bearings and has pretty much amazing action. My God, this is a this is a very very beautiful knife. I I personally am extremely fickle about carbon fiber. Uh, more and more as as uh, the years go by and more interesting patterns come out, I'm 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 coming to this is that carbon fiber is outrageous. What'd you call it? Uh, snakeskin carbon. Snakeskin, fiber. because that's what I, I was gonna say python, but that's the micarta. This really does look like snakeskin and with its gold flex and its irregular sort of scales. It this this is a stunning knife. So this guy is MT Knives. Yes. MT He's also knives. on Instagram. And there okay. is a video on this on the channel, of course. I believe also unboxing and uh, on these custom knives I try to do unboxing and full okay. review so that I can get like the most exposure on the knives. 
Right. This is really amazing. It's it's heavy, of course, because you have large uh, zirconium bolsters, a very large zirconium backspacer. Uh, so it's not something I carry very regularly. Uh, it's more of a, a collection piece and around the house knife, but it just has it's just a gorgeous design, absolutely gorgeous blade with that with a swatch at the top. Mm -hmm. Very nice execution on the plunge grind, mirror edge. It's just absolutely gorgeous. It is. So, so Treddy, what are your um, criteria for evaluation? You get a knife, whether it's, I mean, you, what, what, what I like about your channel a lot is that you have wide range. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not just showing custom knives. You're also showing knives that are production knives that people are talking about or that are interesting. I assume that they all get, yeah, like this Hogue, I assume they all get kind of the same view. Um, naturally, as you go up in materials, you're going to expect more. You go up in price, you'll expect more. But what are the criteria for evaluating a knife for you? So it, it comes pretty pretty natural. What I really like is being very... Um, you build the stuff for a specific purpose, and then everything kind of fits or makes sense in that kind of environment that you picked out for yourself. So if you build a really um, burly, overbuilt knife, you shouldn't go with very uh, thin stock. I'm not one of the guys that says mm -hmm. it has to have a super thin cutting edge for everything and be extremely light. It has to fit its purpose that it was built for. And uh, of course, materials and price always uh, play a certain role. But of course, I am a bit more lenient in custom knives when it comes to specifically blade materials. I love it when you have a custom knife that is using 20 CV or other kind of higher end cutting edge um, blade materials, but I can see when some like uh, part-time maker or maker that is just starting out has to charge a bit more for steels that are not cutting edge like RWL 34, um, CPM 154 or things like that. But I certainly wouldn't uh, recommend uh, a custom knife that uses subpar steel like HCR or something like that, but you mm -hmm. don't see right, that. Right. Um, and then, of course, it's about craftsmanship, fit and finish, um, grinds, of course, which, for example, on this knife is absolute amazing. Who is this? Like, this is the uh, Dmitry Ozarenko Runa. It's a Russian maker from St. Petersburg. It's also pretty, it's not that well known. And he's releasing these in three different sizes. This is the smallest one, one of the first uh, he ever built. And he also is going to release them in three different blade shapes and three different uh, opening methods. So you will have a hole, you will have a thumb stud and uh, something else that I uh, kind of forgot, but very, very uh, cool uh, maker and uh, very amazing grind. The blade was the main thing that sold me uh, on this particular blade shape here. We have a hollow ground swedge, hollow ground main bevel, mm. this very fine media blast finish that really brings out uh, the lines on the blade, super thin cutting edge here for a small EDC blade. That certainly makes sense. And uh, then, of course, action is a, is a very important part. But also, again, it has to be the, the, the right action for the knife and for the design uh, it is intended to be. For something like this, I don't need an extremely uh, snappy, slick, open um, action because this, for me, is a knife that is more of a slow and controlled opener especially with the thumb disc but it certainly is nice if you can middle finger flick it if it's fidgety and uh, of course sharpness it's like this the standard things that, that we guys look for i don't have a specific kind of set but when you pick up a knife you notice the fit and finish you notice the grind the action if it has a uh, in the closing action if you kind of hang up on the d10 pole or not uh, you certainly know that it doesn't have to be drop shoddy it just has to have a refined action so i don't have like buzzwords i look for i have like the overall feel and i try to convey that uh, in my videos that you really um see what i mean when when i describe the, the feel of the knife in hand because i think that's the most uh, the hardest and the most important part to cover in these videos everybody can look up stats and mm -hmm. um and things like that but you have to kind of um uh, convey the the actual feel of the knife and what it makes you think about and how it actually performs in in use. Yeah, I feel like you look at the uh, um, the internal logic of the knife itself. You're not you're not 
I know you compare knives to other knives sometimes, but it's more like um, for what this is supposed to be, you know, this is a $20 Kershaw or this is a, you know, $1,000 um, custom knife for what it's supposed to be. Does everything within its uh, sphere work for its sphere? And how well is it done? So if well he uses done. carbon fiber, did he polish it? Does it have some voids? Does it fit with the rest of the finishes that he chose for that model? Which sometimes may be my error when I combine stuff that is not really, that doesn't really go together well. But just to see if the the thing he set out to do was done uh, to a to a degree that I think is uh, is well done. Is this a Pinkerton you're holding up? Yes. And it's so thinly ground. It's completely he's, insane. Look at the tip. Uh, God, he's an amazing knife maker. Dirk yeah, he's also super underappreciated. He's, yes, he's more well known, but uh, he should be much, much more um, like praised about and spoken about. Um, also, this is a Pinkerton design, the, the right. Kaiser there. Um, uh, if you would hold, uh, pick it back up. I'm not sure what it was, uh, but it had the Westinghouse micarta on the upper left. This. That's the Casey Gray. Casey. Okay. This is the Casey Gray. So this looks to me, first of all, it's stunning and gorgeous. I love, uh, this sort of burnt yellow ochre color next to the, this, the steel color. Those, this color combination really, uh, hits it with me. Same thing with the, with the, with the um mt knives with the with the flex in the carbon fiber uh that sort of gray and yellow combination really gets me but with this knife it looks like that swedge you could sharpen and it would hide nicely oh it looks like a pretty fat swedge but i noticed that it sunk completely uh beneath the handle and i was wondering if that was a feature or just a coincidence yeah yeah okay i'm always looking for a, an opportunity for a double edge because <laughs> i'm a <laughs> dork but uh you yeah. could you could certainly like the first like uh, three quarters you could actually uh, have him sharpen it i might have seen one uh, because he does also this this is the squeaky model which is a pretty funny name but he does these also in a lot of different versions this one has a zirconium uh, thumb disc but there are also um, thumb stud versions there's also a front flipper versions available of these and uh, i actually did buy this on the secondary so i never got the knife directly from mm. casey gray but i had to send it back because the guy i bought it from actually screwed me over it had massive blade play because like one of the washers was missing oh, and uh, then i just could send it into casey gray he took care of everything sharpened it up as well and now it's like perfect again which also shows you there are very very kind and and great people that are building knives and that's the thing you get with custom knives you always have like your uh, maintenance guy at the ready if you're having it from a oh, from yeah. a great maker because i wasn't even the, the first customer i never gave him money for this knife but he still stands behind his product and uh, did fix mm -hmm. that issue i had uh with the knife that was absolutely not his fault at all and he that's... didn't charge me for anything just uh, of course the shipping i paid that's classy. That's, you know, that's, that is part of what you're getting from a custom maker. And you know what, like there are a lot of budding and up and coming custom makers that you can discover on Instagram and be on the ground floor of and get some of their work while it's still uh, not so expensive. And you can really develop a relationship with someone and also the knife itself. Who do you think is doing it best? Like who, who do you think is the most innovative uh, most interesting maker right now? No, I would have to go with VC Edge. Okay. Like newer makers that are not well known for for like modern folding knives, it has to be. Uh, this really um, went completely out of the comfort zone. was the first time since I'm in the knife collecting game that really struck me as completely out of the ordinary and something completely different that I haven't heard of could be done in such a um, perfected way that he has done here. And f for that being only his 22nd folder that he has wow. made, uh, it's just amazing. Okay, so we're we're also gazing at your, your beautiful table here, strewn with gorgeous knives. And the last folder I really wanna talk about, because I also wanna hear your fixed blade knife philosophy but i see that rockstead lurking in the lower left corner 
tell me about this company and like they are that there's like some magic involved in these knives tell, tell us about this yeah so rockstead is also one of these companies that you always aspire to it's a bit like uh, chris reeve but even a step above that Mm -hmm. Because you always, uh, if you're on YouTube or on Instagram, you always see these mirror polished black coated blades, this very uh, flowing uh, line handles with the um, ray skin inserts. And of course, these are very expensive and these are considered even by Rockstead themselves production knives. So these are not custom knives, but they cost as much as some of the customs here on the table. And this is like the modern way of... Uh, um, Japanese knife making and they really have a completely different feel and uh, just aura about them comparing it to everything else to any custom to any uh, high-end production knife or mid tech this just a rock set just feels different uh, it starts out with their kind of clamshell um, Ergol aluminum handles uh, they also have some different models but like the most iconic ones are these which is this is the Ku which is a smaller version of the Shin which is the like the most talked about rock set ever which is just a larger version of this with a three three and a half inch blade this is about mm -hmm. a three inch uh, blade but the design is like identical on the, on the Shin uh, that makes this knife extremely ergonomic you also cannot feel the poker clip which is just a like smoked um, bent over uh, steel clip but that really curves around in a way you see it's very has a very intricate 3d uh, shape in the 3d space so it's not just going down it like curves around and yeah. has different heights along all the areas here and that certainly is what makes it disappear when you're holding the knife also this fits my hand size perfectly that's why I actually went with this. Unfortunately, this model is actually uh, discontinued. So mm -hmm. this will never leave the collection because it would be really hard to get this. And then, of course, in terms of blade steels, I think they work mostly with two. This is like the less expensive version with the YXR7, which is a uh, not a stainless steel. It's a, it's a tool steel that also shows you that it makes sense that they developed this amazing super high hardness dlc that they can bring to a mirror polish like they have it done here uh, mm. on on this uh, knife and then there is the zdp 189 which you certainly know from some of spider code knives but they do hardening like <laughs> nobody else so i believe this is at uh, the yxr7 here i have to look at the card you actually get a card and every single knife has been uh, specifically um, hardened tested you can see here below the um, thumbs down that little point mm -hmm. that's actually oh, yeah, the hardest yeah, yeah. testing uh -huh. divot right there right and then you get a certificate and they write on there i believe it's 66.7 or something Jeez, like that on, on this one here with the yxr7 and these cut like crazy and but you have to send them in to rockstead to get resharpened when they get dull but you also oh. are getting where i bought this you're actually getting a special strop with some special solution and okay. everything i was gonna so ask that are you just amazing I mean, this thing is outrageous, outrageously beautiful. And just watching you open and close it slowly like that, it's it it just looks pleasing in every way. And the access to the lock bar is gorgeous. The milling, the ray skin inserts. Oh my god, the action! It uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What what I find kind of funny and out of character uh, for the design, though kind of charming in a weird way is all the billboarding on this side yeah. it, says, it says the name of the blade it has the japanese character and then a number and on the front it's got rockstead and their giant logo and then on the beautifully very uh interestingly milled pocket clip like you said complex it says made in japan <laughs> on it yeah and th th that's i, I love that th i think that's they really do these things for a very long time. I, I don't know when they started out, but I think their main line of knives is very much unchanged from when they actually started out. So they've been doing and perfecting this for a really, really long time. And I think they just do the things like they have done it uh, for a very long time. And I think that is certainly a relic of earlier areas to just stamp in Made in Japan there on the, yeah. on the clip in a very uninspired font. 
but the <laughs> other billboarding here on this knife, I actually don't mind because it's done so sleek. So they have a large Rockstead logo, but it is not like uh, um, lasered on there or like right, printed right. on there. It's actually like um, carved in there. And yeah. it doesn't have any kind of contrast in terms of, of, uh, of color. It just is very sleek in there. And on the other side, we have the same thing. You get uh, your individual number there. And of course, it says Ku and the um, Chinese, uh, Japanese character. Of course, I probably could go without the Ku because I know that and just mm -hmm. go with the character. That but that cool. is very nitpicky. And since I've done it for, for a long time like this, I certainly don't think they need to change that. I, I mean, I personally think that the billboarding, including the Made in Japan in uninspired font on the clip, is actually very charming because uh, there's a trend right now. And I, I guess I agree with it overall to be very austere uh, with your markings on your blade and to be very, you know, sleek and simple. And this, like you said, it's a it's a bit of pride. It's a bit of, um, you know, something that's been going forever. Uh, and God, I, I love this. Is this a zero ground edge? I'm looking at it. Is it convex or what's the it's edge? It's a edge? convex edge. Yeah. Okay. I got to get myself a Rockstead. I have to get a Rockstead, Treddy, and a, and a Shira Goroff. I, I feel like they're both moral imperatives. And then I can move on with other <laughs> production knives and customs. But yeah. those are those are two knives I don't have and have never even experienced. Even at Blade yeah. Show, never experienced either the, one. These knives certainly change your perspective in terms of high-end production knives they do it differently so the rock set is more of a um in terms of using it's special in terms of cutting with it it's really special ergonomics are great and of course the treatment of the blade itself and the hardness are something to behold and the very unique way of uh, how they do the handle and everything so the whole overall package is special and shirogorov it's mostly just the perfection in machining and of mm. course the action. the action because even though i have a lots of uh, custom knives uh, my shirogorov the larger one the f95 nl is one that has the best action ever and that's one of the least expensive shirogorovs you can get the f95 i'm writing it down <laughs> that's the one with you have one with the green micarta inlays right yes that's the oh, NL. there it is. So, okay, this is the this is the exact, and I think maybe I developed this while watching your video. This is the e the exact Shirogorov I want because this has what the three and a half, three point seven five inch blade. It's uh, got the I believe it's three point seven five. It's it's one of the largest knives in the collection, so it's probably three point seven five. This is really for a large knife. This is absolutely amazing. I didn't That's give it awesome. any kind of impulse. I just. Disengage the lock bar and turn the handle a bit, and it just falls in the. It's, it's amazing. All right, when you lose interest in this and you think it's just kind of lame, it's it's one of my uh, like me... standard size comparison folders together with the um, Neon Zero. So I really can't can't let it go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to pressure you publicly. You know, I, I really love that knife. And uh, uh, Epic Snuggle Bunny, another favorite reviewer, has that very or used to have that very same model. And I think that's the one I have to pursue when it comes time. And I don't know if they even make them anymore, but I think it's beautiful. What what is I think your these, grail? These are quite quite readily available, and they're like they... six fifty or something. So for sure, oh. it's not super crazy. Send me two or three. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, so uh, I want to know now, with all these gorgeous things here, what is what is your grail? What's your grail knife? yeah that's that's quite hard <laughs> um i certainly would love to have a, a david lespect some of his folders i knew it um, I, me yeah. too sorry i'm sorry to be to jump on your words but when i asked you that i was thinking a david lespect would look perfect on that table yeah that's one of the things i tried to acquire on that european custom knife show i go to um but it certainly is also some of the very um, well-known uh, U.S. makers, like something from uh, Richard Rogers would be awesome. Like I had um, the Thinko, like the CRKT Thinko, mm -hmm. that would be great. Or his, is it Axion or Axon, like a very streamlined flipper that he has. Those would be amazing uh, to actually own. But these are really a bit above my comfort zone in terms of um, like primary... Um, price of admission so to say right well then okay so i'm seeing the the fixed blades and i want to find out what your uh they're they're obviously a different 
caliber than a lot of your folders. What do you go uh, to fixed blades for? So in the beginning of the channel, I did a lot of fixed blade reviews. I also did some larger chopping ones. I had like, I still own, but I never show it, uh, the um, Kukuri Machete by Cold Steel. I had mm. a very inexpensive uh, Moonstalker by Condor, which is a great large knife for a very inexpensive price. Um, but then I, once I found the things that I use and that uh, um, I like to own in the fixed blade uh, space, I kind of stopped looking for more things because mm -hmm. I pretty much got everything covered. Some some things I even got like twice because like the use um, uh, like use spectrum for these two is very very similar, mm -hmm. but this is just quite a bit less expensive, and these are like more standard kind of. Uh, camp knives mm -hmm. uh, this is probably the best inexpensive knife in terms of overall ergonomics for my hand size and uh, this is like around 100 bucks it's from kaiser it's a dirk pinkerton design it's a little river bowie with a um like standard kind of uh, rough blade coating like a powder 95 g10 scale but with that handle it's so freaking ergonomic it's not even uh, funny of course if you baton with it uh, you have that swatch which can chew up your your baton a little bit but for everything else this is pretty much perfect for 100 bucks you can't really um, go wrong and you get a great sheath with it actually the drainage hole and everything good clip that nice. comes with the knife so pretty much perfect package for an inexpensive knife and also a knife on a bat on a um, hike or something to give to somebody else if they haven't if they do not have anything uh, on their person um, other than that this is probably one of my do-it-all knives that I have for a very long time now this is I don't really know if this is still in production this is a southern grind uh, full-size oh, jackal yeah the jackal and this is also ergonomically amazing so mainly I'm looking for great ergonomics and uh, also how do you say f like good uh, management of weight in terms of the purpose mm. you're having because this is uh, so heavy that you can do some chopping you have a good area to strike if your baton because it's pretty thick up here and yeah. doesn't have a switch in an area where you don't want it for that kind of purpose but it still manages to get down to a good cutting edge and can be used for um, whittling fire sticking and stuff like that and then for for other things that are really thick, you just have it like for mainly batoning and chopping. Uh, and so it's it's like the same thing, but just a little bit more focused on two things like ergonomics and uh, thick blade thickness and of course material. And point. I am noticing all your not all your fixed blades have points. They're not uh, they're not strict choppers. I, I like the point on the jackal. It looks center line and it looks like you know. If you needed it for a fight, it would be fine, but it also just looks thick and stout and ready to go for for camp stuff. Uh, where where do you see um, where do you see the knife world headed in terms of the trends that are happening now? And what do you see becoming big, say, in 2022 in the next couple of years? In terms of fixed blades or just general? In, in terms more in terms of folders and general in terms of trends where uh, most people are buying knives, which is folders. Okay. So certainly a big thing that is already coming out is integration of Magna Cut in a lot of different uh, production mm -hmm. knives, which is certainly great. Uh, we also will see how well it actually performs when we have it also on a wide variety of different companies. We probably will see some companies that have a little bit harder time of uh, correctly heat treating it than others or just choosing to go a little bit softer to, to minimize kind of... Uh, their um, work with it in terms of warranty and uh, some other things that I think uh, we will see more is the continuing of the trend of very thin EDC friendly mm -hmm. folders, very thin cutting edge, very thin blade stock uh, as well and other than that of course new locking mechanisms are always a big thing mm -hmm. um, but I haven't seen like a real trend I just watched a couple of the SHOT Show videos to see what is coming out, um, but I haven't seen something that is really very new and, and uh, unseen yeah. of. Um, a lot of slip joints have been released from other companies and haven't done that before as well, but I haven't seen a really big trend um, apart from the, from the Magna Cut that I think is really cool.
I can't wait to get my first Magna Cut knife, just not because I've been needing it because no other steel is adequate, but just to have it, I got to say, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how it sharpens and straps and how it works and all of that. Um, I, I think uh, the, uh, the trend of uh, thin, light, sharp, kind of moving away from hard use and more to like, oh, these are knives and they're supposed to cut. Definitely, definitely see that happening. But I'm with you. I, I haven't seen anything yet from SHOT Show where, you know, I've seen some designs that I like, but nothing that seems quite innovative yet. I know Cold Steel has a new lock that they're releasing this year called the Atlas Lock. And and I, I, I'm sure it makes the triad lock look like a slip joint, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be interested to see what that's actually like. And I, like you, like this trend of companies coming out with slip joints just to cover, not just to cover their bases and have wider product line, but because they're classics and people shouldn't forget about slip joints. Not everything has to lock. Not everyone feels that way. But uh, before I let you go, Treddy, I, I like to ask uh, YouTubers and knife reviewers people who invest themselves in evaluating knives and and uh, letting everyone else know their worth, I like to do a speed round. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and they're just uh, uh, one-answer questions. I'll, yeah. I'll ask you a one or the other, and, and I want to hear what you have to say about these. So are you ready, sir? Sure. Okay. Speed round begins now. Fixed or folder? Folder. For Flipper. Sure. Okay. Uh, folder flipper or thumb stud thumb stud washers Thanks. or bearings mm, bearings at the moment tip up or tip down a tip up tanto or bowie mm, that's hard <laughs> yeah i don't know i own a lot of tantos but the ones i do i really love so i go with tanto oh good uh hollow ground or flat ground Hollow ground, if I can get it, and if it's nicely done, it's for me better than a, than a flat ground. I, I like the way it works, and I like the way it looks, and that's important. Yeah. <laughs> full size or small? I, I would have to go with small or mid size. Yeah. Okay. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? It's gentleman's knife, as you can see. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you are a gentleman, sir. Automatic <laughs> or ballet song? I can't have both of them. <laughs> but but if you could, what would you rather? Automatic, have? automatic. I, I haven't never got uh, the the bug for ballast song. <laughs> uh, okay, so zero tolerance or riot? Riot. Benchmade or Spiderco? Benchmade. Oh, that's beautiful. That oaks. Uh, Benchmade over Spiderco. Okay, interesting. Uh, real steel or steel will? I never actually had anything from Steel Will, so I would go with Real Steel because they have some great budget stuff. All right, actually, let me change this. Let me let me let me let me put it to this. Civivi or CJRB? Mm, I would go Civivi because they have the better designs. For me, I would agree, I would agree with you on that. Okay, Mill Titanium or Spring Clip? That that's that's a hard one because it really depends on how it's done. But in general, in terms of function, I like bend clips better. For example, if like it's done zinc. like this, it's oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah, and that zinker you held up had a nice looking yeah. clip. Okay, so carbon fiber or micarta? Uh, these are two of my favorite materials, but I think carbon fiber, because at the moment it is more versatile with all the different stuff that it has coming up. Yeah. My card is always more or less the same. Yeah. Interesting. Finger choil or no choil. I, I like, I like some choils. I would go choil. Okay. Form or function. <laughs> um, function if it looks great and doesn't function it's, it's worse <laughs> than, than not the other way around <laughs> okay i'm i'm fully in the form camp by the way uh desert island knife now this is the one knife that you can have for the rest of your life you're not living on the island but it's a spiritual knife desert island and you can only have one from this day till the end what is it <laughs> uh that's kind of hard <laughs> Um, at the moment, I would say probably 
the Guy Pogeni son, yo. Oh my goodness, we didn't even talk about this. All right, because we'll bring it the, up. It is it is probably the um, knife with the most beautiful wood handle I have ever ever seen. Okay, so this is uh, Guy a Guy G U I Pogetti. How do you pronounce his last name? G U um, Y. So it's it's a Y at the end. G U Y. Uh -huh. That's his his um, first name. And Pogetti is P O G G uh, uh, E T T I. Yeah. This and he's a French maker, not Italian. Oh, okay. Now I like him a little less. No, I'm just kidding. I think this is an absolutely <laughs> gorgeous knife. And I've been I've been watching him on Instagram. And maybe we'll talk about this for a minute in the interview extras. Treddy, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I, I really appreciate it. It's been great to uh, get to know you a little bit over the last hour. Because I've been watching you for so long, it's, it's always fun to meet. And, uh, well, so I look forward to see where your collection goes and, uh, you know, where your channel goes. Thanks again for having me. Uh, it was really a fun, fun podcast. Love to show this off and be on these uh, more talkative kind of long form uh, podcasts just to give a little bit of insight of why I do the stuff I do and how I do it. And uh, it was also great to know you. And uh, I certainly have been watching more and more of your stuff uh, in the last couple of uh, weeks and months because I, I kind of found out about you just like in the last couple of months. Uh, it just kind of went under the radar, but now I really like to, to listen to some knife podcasts and knife not podcasts, of course, uh, and yours now as well is uh, like uh, firm in my podcast uh, podcast list of choice. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. And uh, well, as always, we'll keep in touch and I'd love to have you back on sometime. Treddy, thank you so much for joining us and I'll talk to you in a minute, sir. Thanks. Goodbye, guys. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.